The title of my sermon this morning is Parables Warning of Worldly Wealth. We, we had a parable last week, and this continues the parables through chapter 16 of Luke. We're up to verse 14, and we'll go through 31 today of chapter 16 as we work our way through Luke. And as I said last week, I say again, the great benefit of going through a book is you catch things and talk about things that you might not notice or may avoid on purpose um, if you just are picking things out to, to preach on or to read. And today, I think, is a good example of that. We tend to listen to the Bible and then go on with our life and maybe set the Bible thought back on the back burner um, and the same thing was true in Jesus' day. The religious people, it tended to go in one ear and, and go out the other um, as they had the concerns of life. And Jesus takes it all the way to a, his last parable, we'll, as we'll see, is about a person who did not heed the warning and ended up in hell uh, for it. And so let's, let's work through this scripture. Just reminding you of several big themes of Luke. Luke is, Luke is a good writer, and he is consistent when he establishes a theme. He works through that theme, and we see it over and over. So it kind of gives us, we know where we're at. Jesus is on his way to the cross, and there was an abrupt, there was a, a turning point in his ministry. Things got a lot more serious when Jesus started heading to the cross, and Jesus doesn't mix words. We, we've already seen that. He speaks to the heart of the matter. They'll want to distract him and pull him off of a subject or get mix an eternal subject with a worldly, something that we deal with day to day here, and Jesus won't have it. He's like, no, you need to consider your eternal soul. Uh, the focus in the book of Luke now, at that turning point, is on the things that we do that count eternally. And we, we did a little um, quiz last week on eternal things that we do, things that will matter when we stand before God in judgment, and things that might be important things for us day to day now, but they're not going to matter when we stand before God. Uh, our goal as a believer is to build the kingdom of God. Not the kingdom of self, not the, any kingdoms in this world, but the kingdom of God, the spiritual kingdom. And so, thus there is a great contrast between the temporary worldly concerns, and again, not to say that those aren't important, but they're not eternal. Things that affect us now, uh, and contrast that with things that we do that build eternal wealth. Last week, very interesting parable. I was not familiar with that parable before studying. When I studied it, it was new to me. Uh, dealing with how believers are to handle money, that we are to be shrewd with our money. We are to, we are to save money and take care of money. And it is okay to have some money set aside. It is important to, so that we're not constantly worrying about money. You know, if you are not good with money, you probably think about money all the time. Uh, when you don't have money, you want money. And if you have a lot of money, you think about money all the time too. And he said, you've got to find a mental road where you are shrewd and careful with your money, but your life is not dominated by money. Having money, getting money. We collect our resources so that we can focus our life. So on God's eternal gospel and not on making our bread for that day. This week, he makes the consequences of ignoring that warning very plain, very not good warnings. Contrast between the shrewd followers and the religious Pharisees is where we begin. So we just talked about the shrewd followers. Now the Pharisees don't like it a bit. They're like, who do you think you are, Jesus, talking about money? Luke chapter 16, verse 14. Now, the Pharisees who were lovers of money, 
Now they were very religious. The Pharisees, Luke especially, is a Gentile. He does not appreciate the Pharisees. The Pharisees were not all bad. They they tried to be faithful. They tried to be very, they tried to be holy. They tried to live holy lives. Um, but they got obsessed with things that mankind can do. And understand, religion is what we can do. This is how we express, hopefully we're expressing what is inside in religion, but religion is what man can do. Religion is man-made. And so you've got to separate that in your mind, what you can do from what God did for you. Jesus went to the cross and he died for our sins. We can't do that for ourselves. If you, if you die for sins, you die for your own sins, and you go to the lake of fire after judgment. Jesus did that. We, we're powerless. We are only recipients of that. And that is what we have faith in. That is what changes us. That's what makes us eternal. And so in their effort, hopefully they had good motivation, but somewhere they got obsessed with the religion and they forgot about faith in God over there. Also, they heard what he said about shrewd disciples and money, and they derided him. They were indignant. So Jesus warned them. And he, Jesus, said to them, you Pharisees are those, you religious people, are those who justify yourself before men. So rather than worrying so much about, God, am I doing right? Am I on the right track? You want other people to see that you're on the right track. You want to make sure that everybody knows that you are on the right track. But God knows your heart. And I know all of you have heard Bible verses all your life. Let that sink in. It doesn't really matter what the rest of us think. It doesn't matter what I think. God knows the truth of your heart. And we will all answer for what is in our heart. The truth. God knows your hearts for what is highly esteemed among men. Now get this. Outside these doors, in secular life, what are the important things? Flip on your device and start spinning through. Turn on the TV. And they will tell you tons of stuff that is really important. They'll bombard you with important stuff. And what this scripture, the way I read this scripture is, what is highly esteemed on your device, what is highly esteemed on TV, might be an abomination in the sight of God. He used a strong word on purpose. Disgusting. Totally defiling. Everywhere you go, people are applauding it. And that includes this urgency for wealth. Wealth represents security for us. We all, we live in fear because we're, from at once we left the garden, mankind was in fear. We were, we were fearful. We are scared of judgment. We are scared, scared of criticism. We are scared of hunger. All those things. And that's, I mean, that's, those are legitimate things. Uh, but we are more worried about those temporary meeting those temporary needs than than we are about what God thinks about us. And what is highly esteemed among men is disgusting to God. As I said, Jesus Jesus is not playing. He he's not trying to make us feel good. That's for sure. He's trying to tell us the truth. What is Jesus' motivation? Does Jesus want to make you feel bad? Does he want to make you feel guilty? I think the answer is probably yes, if you're worried about the wrong things. If you're worried about the temporary things, Jesus wants to make you feel bad. We don't like to feel bad, do we? We like to create distance between us and bad feelings. The Pharisees sneered at Jesus because they saw him as a poor man who was followed by other poor men, 
But here he is preaching to them about money. Who do you think you are? Though the Pharisees justified themselves, God who judges the true motivations will be the ultimate judge for all of us. We will all, according to Scripture, Old Testament and New, we will all stand before God and give an account for the choices and the motivations of our hearts that we made during life. Now, there's a thing in the background here uh, in the ancient world, and we this still holds today for a lot of people. There was a thing, religion was dominated by retribution theology, and, and that is a fancy way of saying if you are handsome, then God likes you better than ugly people. I think I said this last week. If you are wealthy, God likes you better than poor people. And so there's something, you know, in the book of Job, when bad things happen to Job, though we know, we kind of have a God's eye view in Job, we know that Job hasn't done anything wrong. His buddies keep saying, you must have done something awful to get this. That's retribution theology. And you see that in the background. And it can slip, I'll tell you, it's hard to avoid. Uh, retribution theology. We all have a little dose of retribution theology. We all, the word karma, karma is retribution theology. You do something bad, something else will happen to you. You do something kind, something good will happen to you. That's retribution theology. And that's in the background of the way um, that the Pharisees are justifying themselves. We have money, we must be okay. Well, it's a false assumption. Jesus died homeless. He didn't do it so we'd say, oh gosh, I think I want to be homeless now. That, that's, that's something different. That's something new. But he was homeless. And he was, he was nailed to a cross. That's, that is the, the most uh, um, torturous death they could think of, punitive death they could think of. So if God blesses those who love him, Jesus had some secrets we ain't learned about. We know that's not true. And so holding this idea of um, that God will bless those who are good or faithful, it sent a lot of people to hell. Uh, they have relied on that, and it's false. So don't rely on religious tradition. We pick up in verse 16. And this is an interesting verse. This is, this is a verse I had never seen before. And so what, what I did there in parentheses is, is I, I went in and looked at the Greek word behind this. But listen to this. The law and the prophets, he's talking about the Old Testament and the Old Testament system of reconnecting with God. The law and the prophets were until John. He's talking about John the Baptist. John the Baptist was the new Elijah who was saying, uh, Make straight the way of the Lord. Elijah returning to say the prophet, the Pharisee, the Messiah is here. And he said the Old Testament was in effect, that Old, Te Old Testament religion, the Hebrew religion, uh, was in effect until John proclaimed me the Messiah. Since that time, the kingdom of God has been preached. The spiritual kingdom, what we've been talking about, the gospel. And everyone, a very interesting phrase, everyone is pressing into it. The kingdom of God. And so the word is viadzitai in Greek. And that is a very violent term. It means to invent, inflict violent force on something, to dominate something, to constrain something, somebody trying to break free, to gain an objective by force, to enter forcibly. So in other words... Jesus says there's a narrow door, and I am that door, and no one gets to the Father but by me. All these other religions, are, you know, we respect individuals, they're false. Those are false religions. Any other pathway, but that very narrow door is false. And he said people are trying to press their own system in there, press in there. They're, they're going to take the kingdom by force. Okay, God. We've always, we Pharisees have always done it this way. We're, we're, we're forcing ourselves into the kingdom. How good does that work? How many people do you think we'll see in heaven 
that have forced themselves in by their own citizens. Not a single person. There will be no, do you understand that? In heaven, there'll be no false pretenders. There'll be no people that we are amazing to us here on earth, but they don't, if they haven't gone through the cross, they're not going to be there. He said it is easier. And so he is here supporting God's system of faith that he set up in the Old Testament. Eric, come to my Old Testament class sometime. Jesus was not a surprise to anybody who reads the Old Testament. Everything, there's nothing really new in the New Testament. Uh, it is just the person is here. The Messiah is here. Here's, that's him, Jesus. He's, he's him. But it's all in the Old Testament. Anyway, he said it's easier for heaven and earth to pass away than for one tittle of the law to fail. Talking about the Old Testament laws. And a tittle is just a, a mark, a slash, like dotting an eye. That would be like a tittle. For one even uh, a, a mark to disappear from the law. Now let me re redo this with that word with a little clarification. The way that I read what it says. The law and the prophets were in effect up until John. Since that time the kingdom of God has been preached. But people still try to force themselves into the kingdom with their own interpretation of God's laws. Their own system. But it is easier for heaven and earth to pass away than for one tittle of God's true law to fail. He was affirming uh, God's Plan. And that's an important point when we talk about, I, I did talk about other religions, Christianity and the gospel is not my plan. I believe it because I believe that it is God's plan. And I believe that it is rational, that it is God's plan. And the more that I study it over the years, the more time I spend understanding it, the more sense, rational sense that the gospel makes as the only way for mankind to reconnect with God. It, but it's not my plan. It's God's plan. And so if somebody has a problem with it, they may direct their problem at me, but they need to take their problem to God. To show how they bend the law, Christ teaches on divorce. And so this is just a quick little caveat that he puts in Luke chapter 16 verse 8 whoever divorces his wife and marries another woman commits adultery whoever marries her who is divorced from her husband commits adultery uh, the point here and I mean it is what it says uh, the point here is that we tend to like to force our system what we think is right onto God's laws. And divorce was one. I'll, I'll show you there were two great schools of thought that were behind this during Jesus' day. Uh, among the Jewish leaders, two schools of thought on divorce. The Hillel school, and Hillel was a, um, a, a rabbi, a very powerful rabbi, a very popular rabbi. They said that divorce was permissible for a husband to divorce his wife for any reason at all. Whatever whim he had, the man was the head of the household, and if he wanted to divorce his wife, that was that it was fine. And I really think that Jesus was probably addressing the Hillel school. Uh, the other one was the Shammai school, but Shammai group said that divorce was permissible only for a major offense, that everything else you had to work through. Jesus strongly responded that marriage is viewed by God as in dissoluble. That means you can't dissolve it. You can't break it up uh, and should not be terminated by divorce. The exception clause is marital unfaithfulness, which the word behind it is pornios. Uh, of course, we get pornography and things like that uh, from, from that word. Sexual deviance. God gave sex for marriage between a man and a woman, and everything out, outside of that is pornea. 
Jesus is saying that God's laws are timeless and unbendable. So that's he put divorce in there because that was um, something that was debated but among different schools of thought. To get back to the grave danger of worshiping money, he, in the next verse he jumps back. He tells one of the most wrenching stories, I think, in the New Testament of the rich man in the fiery abyss. Um, and his point is that wealth does not equate to righteousness. So in response to the Pharisees chiding him about wealth, he talked about divorce because that was a big argument in the Pharisees. And now he's back to the wealth question. So the parable of the rich man and Lazarus. There was a certain rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. But there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, full of sores, who was laid at his gate, at the gate of the rich man, desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came to lick his sores, just to show his miserable estate. The rich man had everything the world could offer. The poor man was a crippled beggar named Lazarus. Now, that is a Greek, Lazarus is a Greek name, uh, a Greek form, probably of the, the Hebrew word Eliezer, which means God helper. So his name is meant to be a clue that, that he had a relationship, a faith relationship with God. He had nothing. And, and that's, that's an important point because the rich man is depending on his wealth. Lazarus is depending, all he has is his relationship with God. One lived in luxury for himself, the other in abject poverty, hunger, poor health with the sores. Lazarus was righteous, but not because he was poor, but because he depended on God. Eternal consequences. Verse 22, so it was that the beggar died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's bosom. Um, He's getting into territory here that not much has been written about. I can't, I can't say, make a ton of comment on where exactly. We'll see here, it, there are a lot of different um, ideas about afterlife that come together in the Bible. Uh, ancient people believed that when we passed from this life, that we went into a hold, basically a holding time. Um, Old Testament con uh, concept we'll see here in the notes in a minute was Sheol. And mainly you hear talk about wicked people going to Sheol, but occasionally you hear about some good people being in Sheol also. So we're on holding, awaiting the day of judgment. And the, we'll call this paradise. I don't think this is heaven exactly, uh, though it could be. I believe when Jesus said, today you shall be in paradise to the thief on the cross, I think wherever Lazarus is, that's where that thief is going to be too, awaiting final judgment. The rich man also died and was buried, being and being in torments in Hades. Now, I appreciate New King James. It translated the Greek literally and put Hades Old King James would say hell. And, and my problem with that is there's a lot of different things talked about in the Old Testament and the New Testament that have been grouped together as hell. I think uh, the rich man has not faced God yet at this point. And, and we'll see in the notes. Let me not anticipate my notes. Let me wait for those. He was in Hades. He lifted up his eyes and he saw Father Abraham far off. There's a chasm between paradise, where Abraham is, and Hades, where the rich man is. And Lazarus, Lazarus was in Abraham's bosom, was comforted in paradise. So Hades is the Greek word often translated hell. It's used 11 times in the New Testament. In the Greek Old Testament, it used Hades to translate the Hebrew word Sheol, which was the place of the dead. And I'm not... I'm not thrilled about that. I wasn't consulted about that uh, choice because, as I said, there are not necessarily just wicked people 
in Sheol in the Old Testament. Mainly wicked people, but there's also some, some righteous people there. But when they translated uh, Sheol into Greek, uh, they, they put Hades, the Greek word. Hades is a Greek concept. Here it refers to the abode of unsaved dead prior to the great white throne of judgment. So awaiting final judgment. Abraham's side refers to a place of paradise for Old Testament believers at the time of death as they await judgment. We pick up back in verse 24. Then he cried and said, this is the rich man, cried, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. And send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue. For I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember that in your lifetime you received good things. You lived large. You had the car that you wanted. You had the house you wanted, etc., etc. All the things that are tempting to us, that we want. He had those things in his day. And likewise, Lazarus had evil things. He had hardship and hunger and sores. And that doesn't mean anything. Those things don't mean anything eternally if you cling to God. And Jesus has already said it's okay to have money, to be, be shrewd with money, but if money becomes the priority, the highest value, then it's going to send you to Hades. And likewise, Lazarus the evil thing, but now he is comforted because he clings to God in faith and you are tormented. The Bible insists. Remember this. When people says, well, what about such and such? <clears throat> the Bible insists that God is just. That means that no innocent people will end up in the lake of fire. There will be nobody in the lake of fire after judgment that does not deserve be there by their own choice, by the own choices they make. And I, I, I insist, as I envision Judgment Day, I think the veil of sin, the grayness of the world will be lifted and we will see clearly. We will, and we'll be focused on our own life. We will be, oh, I, now I see the truth about you. We will be, now I see the truth about me. And I think we will all say the same thing that we deserve the lake of fire for the choices we made. I, I don't think there'll be anybody protesting when they're sent to the lake of fire because they will see the justice. I think the people that gnashed their teeth were the people that are deceived here in the world. And they think that they're okay. They think that they're approved of God. They think they did enough. And they get to the great white throne of judgment. They didn't. They didn't rely on the God. They fact they looked for other ways than Jesus to get to God. That justice of God is that we'll share the eternal fate of that which we now value the most. Okay, and so follow me on this. What is highest in your heart, you will cling to. And if it is human relationships, human relationships are going to pass away. If it is money, money is going to pass away, etc., etc., etc. And you will share the faith. And, and, and a very important verse is in 2 Peter uh, 3.10. It says, but the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. This is the judgment of God in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise. Sounds like an explosion to me. 
and the elements will melt with fervent heat. But the earth and the works of our hands in it will be burned. And that sounds a lot like the lake of fire to me. That what if you cling to the things that you have done in this world, if you stand on your effort, when those things pass away, you will pass the same way with them. The rich man had clung to his wealth, and his eternal bill had come due. Hear the words of the rich man. Listen to what he says. In verse 26, and besides all this, between us and you, this is Abraham talking to the rich man, there's a great gulf, so that those who want to pass from here to you cannot. It's done. The bill has come due. Nor can those pass from there to here. A great chasm separated paradise and Hades so that no one could cross from one to the other. And see, that's also in the, the, that's the justice of God. But remember, there's also grace in God. If you hear me talking, that means you have a chance to change your course. And Jesus died, gave his life, and it was no easier for him than it would be for you or me to give our life for someone else. He died so that you still have the opportunity to change your way, to change your pathway. In verse 27, 28, then he said, then the rich man said to Abraham, I beg you, Father, therefore, that you would send Lazarus to my father's house. For I have five brothers. And what, what is apparent that is not said is, and they're living their life like I did. They're relying on their wealth. That Lazarus may testify to them, lest they also come to this place of torment. The rich man begged that Lazarus be sent to warn his brothers. Maybe if a man returned from the dead, maybe then they would listen. I have my doubts that they would. I think they would probably say this is some kind of trick. I'm going to I'm going to cling to what I'm clinging to. Verse 29 Abraham said to him, they have mo Abraham's answer was was straight up. He said they have Moses and the prophets. They have the scripture, the truth of the scripture. We have the Bible. We have 66 chapters of God's self-revelation. Let them hear what God has already given. And that is the most amazing thing about that Bible. The truth is in there. But God has not jammed it down anybody here's throat. You all have the choice to open it up and read it and believe it or leave it closed and do your own thing. Find your own way. And that's what he said. He said, I've, God has given the truth. He's laid it out, laid that 66 chapters. There's a lot in there. I find new stuff every time I open it. Well, most of the time, I, many times I open it. And he said, no, Father Abraham, that's not enough. People aren't reading their Bible. If, if having a Bible would save them, I would have been saved. I had a Bible. I just didn't look at it. Or when I looked at it, I didn't think much of it. But if one goes to them from the dead, they will repent. And that, of course, Abraham said they refused to listen to the scriptures. They'd refused to listen to a dead man. All right. I forgot to put my... That's two weeks in a row I've done that. But he said to them, they will not hear Moses. Neither will they hear one who rises from the dead. The rich man and the Pharisees wanted signs. They wanted a big demonstration. Again, if 
Bible's not enough. We want to be amazed by something. But if they refuse to believe the scripture, they would not believe any sign, no matter how great. And as we close, I just I want you to think about this. I want you to go back and read this this week. I want you to think about where you are in faith matters. Um, Say, so what would it take to penetrate that shell? What sign, what truth would it take to penetrate my defenses and get me to listen to God? Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this, this hard word. Help us to have spiritual ears and to hear the truth. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. <clears throat>